Thank you so much for leading us in music this morning and for everyone joining together as we worship the Lord together. Grab your Bible if you would and let's open it together in uh, John chapter 18, the Gospel of John chapter 18. This is uh, um, what is known traditionally as Palm Sunday, and um, though we won't be really touching on that, it is significant for us to think about that final week of Jesus before the cross. And specifically, our focus uh, this morning for a few moments will be uh, the final hours, really, um, day before the cross and uh, the significance of some of the events that happened there. But you know, um, in your Gospels, there is a huge amount of time um, and space that is given to the account uh, of things that happen surrounding the cross. And uh, there's, there's great length of time and space given as well to earlier uh, signs and miracles and teachings that Jesus did as he walked the earth. But uh, there is a, a huge portion of time given to that final week and even those final days uh, surrounding the cross. And so we want to give some time and attention to this spot this morning. And then following the message, we will be taking time for communion. And so uh, be thinking of that as we uh, spend this time. Just know that that's kind of in your mind where we're, where we're heading. So let's just bow together for a moment of prayer as we look into the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you are good and uh, we can sing of that goodness. So help us in these moments then to acknowledge your, your goodness and your sovereignty and your rule in our lives and to um, listen to what you are telling us through your Holy Spirit from your word and that we would be drawn to you today and whatever matters are on our heart and on our mind, may there be no greater matter than... Um, your presence in our lives and uh, the things that you are doing presently in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So Father, may we be encouraged together and we do thank you for your holy, inspired word uh, and we look at it now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're not going to go into a lot of detail in uh, chapter 18 and chapter 19, but I do want us to be aware of some of the things that, that are going on here. So I'd like us to begin reading, and I know uh, in our scripture reading, we read a little eight later in chapter 18. I'd like to back up just a bit to verse 1 of uh, chapter 18 and read uh, from there. When Jesus had spoken these words, and you remember we spent a couple of weeks on uh, John 15 and, and uh, Jesus spoke uh, words and then there was a prayer that we were able to look at as well and notice some things from. So when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests, and the Pharisees went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, "'Whom do you seek?' They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken 
Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And we'll stop there. So the arrest of Jesus takes place. There are many things that uh, people seek to do uh, at this time when Jesus is arrested. And uh, we often look at, at how people respond to Jesus. When he earlier was giving some teachings, there were those who accepted and those who rejected. And we see various responses So if we were to kind of look in the same way, uh, what are some of the responses that are happening here? Well, we have the the soldiers that come and Judas kind of leading them along in this moment. We have Judas who betrays the Lord, mentioned as a betrayer here. We have Peter who in this moment kind of decides to put up a fight and not let this thing just happen quietly. And so he cuts off an ear, probably was aiming for a head and missed. We have the soldiers who, uh, in the presence of Jesus, uh, an interesting passage that tells us that they, they drew back and fell to the ground. So there was a tremendous amount of, of uh, either supernatural power uh, present in this moment or a recognition of, of who Jesus really was. And we have their response. Then they move from this moment to uh, various trials that take place. And so in the next section, we, we find out that um, he, he stands in front of a number of people. And again, we won't be looking at this in detail, but the, one of the individuals who had served as high priest and was the father-in-law of the current high priest, so his name is Annas, and you'll see in chapter 18 that Jesus appears before him. And then Caiaphas, the one who was in the role of high priest. So uh, both of these individuals... Uh, Jewish individuals who are um, officials, the highest in the land, so to speak, from Jewish perspective at that time. Then, and it gets complicated here, and if you've spent time reading these chapters, you say there seems to be a lot of shifting, a lot of back and forth of what's going on. Uh, He meets uh, before Pilate. And there are a couple of instances there meeting before him. And in these chapters, we also have Peter denying the Lord. And uh, individuals say, you were with him, you know him. And, and Peter say, no, no, not me. You got, you got the wrong guy. And he uh, denies the Lord. Wow, there seems to be an awful lot uh, of this um, uncomfortableness around Jesus. Uh, kids, some of you remember... Uh, what it is to play that game of hot potato. And uh, whatever uh, the object is, you pass it around, and no one wants to be caught with the object uh, when the music stops or whatever. And I feel that there are individuals who, who aren't quite sure what to do with Jesus at this particular point in time. They just know that they don't want to be the ones that decide the final outcome. And there seems to be this push and shove. Like, yes, we'll meet with Jesus and talk with him. We'll hear what he has to say. But then we're going to pass him on to someone else. The question I have for us this morning in our brief time together is what is your response to Jesus? What is it that you would do with him. Not only if you were in this moment, how would you have responded then, but how would you be responding today in your own life? What are you doing with Jesus now? It seems like 
It could even be that in our present lives that we are involved in this game of hot potato. We are happy to talk about Jesus and spend time associating with the things of Jesus when we're in these walls, when we're around other people that are doing the same thing. But then when it comes to a little different environment, it may be that we are very quick to pass Jesus off to someone else not desiring to speak for him, to acknowledge him, whether it was a Peter syndrome or uh, as some of the other officials uh, falling prey to the pressure of, of the crowd, and what others wanted to do with him. What will you do with Jesus? In this moment that we have together, let's draw our attention, first of all, to chapter 18 and verse 33 and following. This is part of the section that was read earlier in Scripture uh, reading. Uh, This is an exchange between Pilate and Jesus. Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? In those verses, we begin to uh, understand a little bit of what Jesus is communicating to uh, one of the rulers of the land, one of the Roman uh, leaders, Pilate. And as he speaks, they have this exchange about kingship. And I would suggest to you that that is an extremely helpful thing for us as we ponder what we are to do with Jesus. One of the things that I think is is significant from this passage is that we see Jesus as a king and that we acknowledge him in that regard. And so we'll talk a little bit about king and kingdom. Jesus is a king. This was the concern of the individuals because if if Jesus was presenting himself as the king, well, that became a threat to others who considered themselves rulers or kings. But Jesus kind of put that to rest when he said, "My, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not the same kind of rule that you would be expecting from me. And of course, this was the discussion that Jesus often had with the disciples. They were wondering if now would be the time that uh, Messiah would would truly bring things in order in a military sense, in a political way. That's what they were looking for, to overthrow the Romans and life to get uh, a little easier for them. But Jesus was stating this is not the kind of kingdom that he came uh, to present at this particular time. Now, there's a lot of theological discussion um, uh, about kingship and kingdom, and I would encourage us to to think of it uh, from a particular angle. Uh, When we talk about being a part of the body of Christ, we use the analogy of uh, a a human body, and that's that's a part of of Scripture here. You know, you got a head, you got a foot, you got all the parts of the body, and of course, Christ being the head 
and we, parts of the body, all fitting together in him. So we talk about the body. Uh, we talk about a, a building that, that we are uh, placed into this building, Christ being the cornerstone, the foundation of the building, all of us being various parts of it. We talk about being a family, uh, being adopted into the family of God. That's another way that we describe what it is to become a Christian. And, and so let's add one more analogy, that of kingdom. When Jesus came to earth, he uh, inaugurated, he established a kingdom, but not one of a physical realm at this particular time. And just as uh, John the Baptist preached, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then uh, later we see Jesus saying the same words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, Jesus is a king, and he, his kingdom has begun, and when you are born again by the Spirit of God, you become a, a member of the uh, kingdom of God, and yet our kingdom is not of this world, as Jesus said doesn't operate in the same way that a, a government system uh, operates. We can be very thankful for that, by the way. The kingdom of God is uh, primarily a spiritual kingdom at this particular time. And we see that uh, as Jesus presents himself as the king, is rejected by the world, but yet the kingdom has begun nonetheless. And so there's a little terminology that uh, that you as a believer may be familiar with when we talk about the now and not yet aspect of God's kingdom, uh, that absolutely when we become a child of God, uh, we are a part of that kingdom, and yet it is not fully realized yet. And we look for, toward the future, toward a future millennial kingdom, a literal reign of Christ on the earth, uh, where some of these things will be more fully realized. But that does not negate the fact that you and I belong to, as believers, this spiritual kingdom that, that Jesus speaks of here. So he is a king, but his kingdom is not in the same way as the earthly kingdoms. He says if it was that way, then he would have been encouraging Peter to keep fighting. Take off more than an ear next time. But that is not the instruction that he gave him. As a matter of fact, he, he said to Peter, and we read it earlier, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And so Jesus as king was coming to die. And so that's a shift uh, from how we uh, think a, a kingdom ought to operate. Obviously, the, the king in his position would be uh, greatly protected and, and he would not be facing death. That would be the last thing. And yet here is the king who is willingly progressing forward to death. <clears throat> Did you notice that in in the garden, as Jesus finished praying, there is this sense of, okay, it's time to, to move forward now. The betrayer is at hand. It's, it's time. It's not time to run away and avoid this. No, he, this king is going to lay down his life for his friend. What a beautiful picture that is as we realize that Jesus lovingly, willingly, fulfilling the will of the Father went to the cross for you and for me. The other aspect to this, and, and uh, again in this interchange between Jesus and Pilate, in this exchange that happens here, uh, they talk not only about kingdom, but about truth. And, and Jesus said, verse 37, Pilate said to him, are you a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this uh, a purpose I have come into the world 
to bear witness to the truth. And of course, Pilate says, well, what, what is truth? And, and he says that in a cynical way, like nobody can really know what truth is. But Jesus is, is saying you can know exactly what truth is. And if you uh, follow me, if you hear and listen to my voice, then you will know the truth. And this, of course, uh, reminds us then of some of those powerful statements that Jesus made. Jesus made several I am statements in the book of John. I just want to remind you of a few of these, declaring who he was and, and making it very ab- abundantly clear. And, and, and the writer of John actually tells us uh, that the reason these things are written down is so that we would uh, know who Jesus is and be able to believe in him. And that's, that's why we have this gospel here. And some of you have been directed, if you, uh, when you first came to know the Lord, uh, some of you have asked, where should you start reading? And well, <clears throat> there's no wrong place to start reading in the Word of God. But often uh, people recommend the gospel of John because it lays out so clearly who Jesus is. And, uh, and, and what a wonderful place to kind of see his identity laid out clearly. And uh, people often would refer to the book of Romans as well as a place, even though it's deep theology, it helps us understand the gospel so well. But here, and just listen as I mention a few of these I am statements that you can find in the gospel of John. Jesus said in John 6, I am the bread of life. In John 8, I am the light of the world. In John 10, I am the door of the sheep. In John 10 also, I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 15, I am the vine. We talked about that one recently. And so in all of these statements, it is pretty clear who Jesus is. He's, he's making these declarations that he is divine, that he is God, that he is also man. Uh, come together, the God-man, in order that he may be our one true sacrifice, the only sufficient sacrifice. So as we transition to a time of communion this morning, uh, what are you doing with Jesus? Well, number one, I hope that you are a part of the kingdom of God. If you are not, I encourage you to, by faith, accept what Christ has done on the cross as payment for our sin. By faith, we come to Him and receive that gift and become a part of the family of God, a citizen of the kingdom of God. That's the first thing. The second thing is, very closely related, to to acknowledge the truth, to walk in the truth. Just as He is the truth, we are to walk in that truth. And so again, it's the idea of knowing Jesus and uh, uh, acknowledging who He is. And so with that said then, uh, this prepares the way for us to talk about sacrifice, which we'll do in a moment at the table of the Lord. So we're going to pause right here and going to invite our team to come and lead us in a song. And those that are helping with communion can come and prepare the table.